This is a Nature News article uh, published this week called Prior Omicron Infection Protects Against BA... I actually don't know if you, how you pronounce this, BA.4 and BA.5 variants. I haven't heard it pronounced. I haven't either. I've only been reading it. Um, so again, the headline, Prior Omicron Infection Protects Against BA.4 and BA.5 Variants. Catching an earlier version of SARS-CoV-2, particularly Omicron, provides some immunity against the two fast-spreading lineages. Okay, if I may have my screen back, Zach. Thank you. Um, I want to say a few, a number of things here. And rather than simply dissect the Nature News article, we're going to go to the preprints that they are uh, that they are referring to. Uh, and that's one of one of the points I want to make. That uh, now, apparently, uh, when the news suits nature, we are allowed to talk about the science reported in preprints as we were early in the days of COVID. Uh, but for a while there, we were being told that if it hadn't been peer reviewed, then it wasn't really science. And uh, we weren't really supposed to be uh, referring to that as a scientific result. So, that is that is fascinating, yeah. and it is a major concession. In many ways. Without there being With the, any of actual course, concession, of it's course. a tacit concession. Right. That, that's I, I, that's that's one of the sort of three main things that I noticed about this. And you know, again, I'll, I'll link to the article in the show notes. Um, but the entire article is referring to mostly one, but also a second uh, preprints, which are exactly the style of papers that uh, most of us have, have have been having to rely on almost exclusively throughout COVID in order to figure out what is going on, uh, in part because early on, um, the rate of research was just so fast and furious that the journals couldn't keep up. And then at some point, of course, you started to get um, you know, censorship within the journals, wherein non-acceptable, non-mainstream you know, conclusions weren't being published. And so peer review became a mechanism of censorship. But now we have two preprints being discussed in Nature News. Yes. Yeah, I just want to say, um, I'm going to try to remember, this actually dovetails with something I plan to talk about later in our discussion. Okay. Uh, it's a third example of something for which I had two. Um, so anyway, uh, I've made a note to myself, but if you hear it come up in line and I fail to mention it. I mean, you, if you want to talk about it now, you can. No, no. I, okay. I, I want to wait so that you have the other two and you can see uh, the, okay. the pattern. Okay. Uh, so that's that's one point about this article. Um, another is, and you know, no doubt everyone has noticed that for a while we were getting new variant names. You know, every time... I don't, every time what? what was I, how, would, how would I even finish that sentence, right? We were getting new variant names. And then Omicron shows up, depending on where you are in the world, to end of 2021. And we're still in Omicron. But now we're getting new like subvariant names. And this feels like the kind of game that systematists play. Systematists being the type of uh, scientists who are uh, you know, biologists, who are evolutionary biologists, who are phylogeneticists, who are systematists. Um, those type of evolutionary biologists being those who are trying to determine the relationships between species or, in this case, um, viral variants. And you know, at what point that you you decide, oh, that's actually a species versus a subspecies in the case of an organism rather than a virus, um, is a judgment call. But this change from we're getting new variants to we're getting new you know sub subvariants of Omicron feels also like it was political rather than scientific. And there's no discussion as far as I see as to, you know, no justification as to why that is the case. So I want to point out, it, it is beyond a judgment call. It is arbitrary unless somebody has set out a standard against which you would have to make a judgment call. In other words, mm -hmm. you could say here you need a certain number of substantive changes to the code before you call it uh, a new variant versus a subvariant or something. Yeah. But absent Which that is exactly, standard, that's the kind of rule that you could use for viral variants. You couldn't use that for species because we don't, we don't have them sequenced at that level. Right. Part. And yeah. in biology, in most disciplines, which do not focus on phylogenetics, but have to interface with it, as most of the disciplines in biology do, yeah. there is not an awareness of how little meaning is yeah. contained in the level of distinction, right? The fact that things are a clade is meaningful, mm -hmm. but the fact that we call it a family versus a subfamily or, you know, a genus versus uh, uh, a subgenus is is meaningless, right? Some of us. 
eschew categorical rank. Well, yeah, we joke in our household that we eschew categorical rank because Arnold categorical Kuhn, rank being family genus those those, right. those or, order. Yeah. We do not at all eschew the description of the clades. That is to say, who is related to whom is a factual question. You can get it right, you can get it wrong, but there is nothing arbitrary about it, right? Two creatures are more closely related to each other than either are to a third, right? That's a mm -hmm. factual description. There's no judgment call there. Um, it's just a question of what the evidence suggests the relationship is. And we may have it wrong, but the history is the history. Right. The history yeah. is whatever the history is, even if we never figure out what it is. Yeah. So amongst those of us who take phylogenetic systematics very, very seriously at a logical level, you know, Heather and I, for example, if we are having a dinner table conversation and somebody says, I don't remember, you know, is a skunk a weasel? Is it a mustelid? Right? The answer is, it doesn't really matter because skunks, as, mind you, I'm remembering. <laughs> we should have done this was, with a tree. We should yeah, have prepared the visual have, for this. I should have looked this up to see yeah. whether this is still the evidence. But the evidence is, although skunks are not classified within the mustelidae currently, they are the group right outside of it, which means that you could have just as easily made the group one rung larger and it would include them. And so the point is that somebody's arbitrary judgment Skunks happen call. to be put into something called the Mephistids, I think, and then we got the Mustelids, which is all the weasels. Right. But and, if yeah. if the Mustelids, the weasels, plus the skunks is a group that doesn't exclude anybody, then the point is, well, we don't have to uh, have a discussion about whether they're technically in the Mustelidae. We know what the relationship is. And so what you're pointing out with respect to these variants mm -hmm. is that I mean, maybe there is some standard somewhere, and we will hear about it, um, or maybe there isn't a standard, as is mm -hmm. true in so many quadrants of biology, yeah. and the basic point, maybe uh, new variants were beginning to grow old, and so people, you know, they didn't want to have to learn how to speak about a new variant, so they've downgraded the level of evolutionary difference uh, in, you know, in uh, in the, at the, at the, level of parlance or worse um you know the, the the propagation of new variants was making people question the efficacy of the public health policies that were in place which you know largely mass vaccination right right, right. and so really the question i would argue there's a natural place that you could draw this distinction which is natural immunity right in other words that's you where we're going here oh it is mm -hmm. all right then well I no i mean well my yeah. my point would be I would say you are meaningfully dealing with a new variant at the point that the immunity that you got to your prior variant uh, fails to pre prevent you from getting the new one. Okay, so let's just finish talking about the variants here. But then this this is interesting because this does tie together. You know, we haven't we didn't talk about what I was going to. Yeah. We the you the you and <laughs> God <laughs> the you and I uh, did not discuss in advance what I wanted to say here, but uh, I think that will you'll see that that fits together very nicely. Um, let's just see what the CDC has to say about variants, though, shall okay. we? Um, Zach, you may show my screen. This is, um, yeah, CDC page, you can see at the top there, SARS-CoV-2 variant classifications and definitions. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of, you know, key definitions, you mutation, recombinant, lineage, variant, key points. And uh, I'm going to, if I may have my screen back for a moment, just go to my PDF. Zach, thank you, uh, so that I can, uh, here we go, uh, okay, so this is the same document, you can see this is just a PDF version of that same document, um, they are talking about here key points um, with regard to variants of SARS-CoV-2 in their document, they say, Vaccines approved and authorized for use in the United States are effective against the predominant variant circulating in the United States and effective therapeutics are available. <laughs> really? That seems like quite a general statement for which there is no evidence offered. Uh, and it's not hot linked, unlike a lot of the things they've got here. Uh, and then if you go down further and find that um, all of these, there's all these variants being monitored, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, eta, iota, kappa, zeta, mu, who knew? Who knew? And, uh, and what we have under variants of concern is um, Omicron, okay? Omicron is the only variant of concern at the moment, but it's got all these different lineages. Attributes of Omicron as the variant of concern include 
potential reduction in neutralization by post-vaccination sera, which strikes me as rather directly in conflict to the earlier claim in this very same document that uh, what we've got in the form of vaccines is exactly what you need for the dominant strain, which Omicron is. So within a single document, this took nothing. This took nothing, just like CDC variants, what do they have to say? Huh, within one document, they contradict themselves, and they do it without even pretending to be referring to any actual evidence. They just are making claims, um, and I don't know, hoping that no one notices, which so far, very few people seem to be noticing, at least if they have a voice in the public Square. You know, every so often there's a story of somebody who has faked their way into some profession <laughs> and, you know, is behaving as a surgeon or something without ever having studied the, the discipline, uh -huh. right? They usually make a point of doing better than the CDC does at being a public health authority. Yeah. It's really remarkable yeah. how badly the CDC does at this job. And even, I mean, if we understood the CDC to be simply a PR uh, organization at this point, which I mean, we've said this before, and it's been a while since we've talked about this. But uh, when back when we were in grad school, before every trip, and indeed back when I was running study abroad trips, I would be on the phone with the CDC in advance, trying to figure out exactly you know why the recommendations for the particular vaccinations were for where we were, because different part you know it, it doesn't make sense to have, for instance, an Ecuador wide or a Madagascar wide vaccination recommendation, because frankly the low, you know the jungles, the lowland tropical forests on the coast are going to have very different diseases with very different vectoring insects than you're going to have at elevation where it gets to freezing or below freezing at night, right? It's just not going to be the same, the same illnesses. So I have had in the past several very compelling conversations with the tropical disease people at the CDC. Uh, and th that is part of why I find myself feeling almost yeah, repeat. I mean, I'm over it at this point because I no longer take them seriously. I don't know who could, but it feels like something happened to this agency because it used to actually at least have some number of people. Well, it is who are competent. It is an exact mirror of what I always say about the effect of the Clinton administration on the Democratic Party. Hmm. That the Clinton administration is the point at which the Democratic Party abandoned working people. And representing working people, whether you're cynical about it or not, is a go-to winning strategy in democracy. Sure. But what the Democratic Party did under Clinton was it embraced the same kind of corruption that the Republicans were so good at. And so the point is it needs to pretend to care about people now, but it has real constituents, right? People yep. who pay up. Yep. And the yep. CDC has made the same transition. Mm -hmm. It has gone from serving people who wish not to get sick to uh, serving, um, let's just say, an industry with very special product placement needs, <laughs> right? They, uh, they're they excellent at getting a product placed, like, for example, in uh, millions of arms. 